morning and welcome to Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Good morning to all of you joining us locally by radio and streaming online. We appreciate you tuning in. Today is Sunday, July 29th, 2018, and I'm your host, Hertzy Hertz, here in studio with Julie and Maddie. This is an open up conversation, and we welcome and encourage listener interaction with your phone calls to 952-946-6205, your emails to radio at mnatheist.orgs, or tweet us at at Atheist Talk. The phone number is only available when we're live, but you can always t- email or tweet us whether we're live or you're listening to this podcast. So today, today we're, we're doing a show that came to me not in a dream, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could I could start that way, but I I just spent my last week at Camp Quest North, which was awesome, uh, lots of fun, and we will have Camp Quest as a guest, of course. Uh, but we did a skit for the campers on Friday night called Applesauce and Jelly, and this starts with two counselors saying, "I have." so many bug bites, which is true, actually. I mean, I have a <laughs> ton of bug bites. But our our remedy for these bug bites is applesauce and jelly. And then we start going about what other things can we use this for? And in the end, you are covered. <laughs> I had applesauce and jelly in places I did not think I would ever have applesauce and jelly. <laughs> uh, we have toddlers. We have grandbaby toddlers. <laughs> We understand. We understand. Oh, yes. Definitely. Oh, yes. So, but it made me start thinking, like, you know, what is some of our favorite homeopathy and pseudosciences? And by favorite, I don't necessarily mean, like, we believe in it, because I think the three the three of us are fairly skeptical about this stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm a member of Minnesota Skeptics. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but, I mean, there is some stuff that sometimes we do look at, and we're like, well, I mean, like you mean like, well, maybe that has a plausibility, or like, or or like some anecdotal. Sometimes you look and you're like, well, it did work for so and so. Oh yeah, I see that a lot. Like, they like being in the healthcare field. A lot oh of, yeah. Oh well, you know this acupuncture seemed to work for my coworker, or uh, it's like, no. No, it really didn't. Um, yeah, confirmation uh, bias. Yeah, they, 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 I only have the one thing, and it's, it's deodorant. So, watch out. <laughs> uh, so, because I have no problems with antiperspirant, but there's a, a a group who does not like antiperspirant because it has aluminum, and apparently that's poisonous to us, which is kind of odd because I do believe that is the second most common element on Earth. Yeah, right mm-hmm. behind silicone. Yeah. It's or like, still, yeah. So it's like, ha, yeah, yeah, that's going to be very dangerous to us. Something that is just about everywhere. <laughs> well, I mean, aluminum is toxic to you. Well, yeah, I mean, everything's toxic if, depending on how much you... you right. In- Dose determines the poison. Exactly. Right. Um, and I do know that, you know, if you are missing a kidney or if you have kidney problems, they do ask you to steer away from that. And when I read the background of that, I was like, well, yeah, they were giving people with kidneys a pill that had nothing but aluminum in it, <laughs> like powdered aluminum. Like, that's a lot more than the antiperspirant. Well, and like with every every time I hear like a, a conspiracy theory or a danger or something like that, I the first thing with this one. Okay, but the foundation of the claim. Mm-hmm. Does, it, does aluminum, is it going to be toxic? Sure. You know, that that's a claim that we can evaluate. But is the aluminum from your antiperspirant even getting into your bloodstream? Exactly. Is it really absorbing through your skin? And to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I do. I'm I heard, listening. I, I, I heard a thing about this. So what it does is it basically it gets in, it goes into the pore, your sweat pores, basically. So if you have a cut or something like that, it can get into your system. But it just gets into the pores. It doesn't go any farther than that. Okay, and now that it's into your body... What well, it's is not the, in your body. It's just in the pores, and then it comes out. Well, if it get, even if it gets into your body, though, what's the bioavailability of the aluminum now that it's in your body? Like, what is it bound to when it's, you know, in the antiperspirant? Is it bound in, in a way? Because aluminum binds. It's one of the reasons why it took so long for uh, aluminum to be um, used so widely is because, yes, it's ubiquitous in the environment. But 
it is always bound to something else. They couldn't that, separate true. it and purify it. In fact, they capped the Washington Monument with alum, aluminum just to show how wealthy uni- the United States was. Because aluminum at the time was worth far more than gold. Wow. Because it was so hard to separate. This was before we understood the process of electrolysis and how to pull it out. But it's I, like... I think I think in antiperspirant, it's aluminum zinc. Don't quote me on that. Well, right. And I honestly, you know, I, it's not, I'm not an aluminum expert. <laughs> I don't. I just know that these are the questions. Like before, we jump to it's going to kill you. Yeah. We like we need to assess the steps along the way. Well, so so because of that big scare, though, there's this crystal aluminum deodorant stuff that's been going around, and what makes me laugh is the ingredient is ohm. 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 A l u m, which oh. I'm guessing Julie already knows, <laughs> is short for. Uh, aluminum. <laughs> yeah. There is aluminum in it. Alum. It's aluminum. It's aluminum potassium, oh, okay. which is also the ohm that you use in cooking. If you, I think it's in Snickerdoodles. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this, no, uh, no, 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 not Snickerdoodles. Alum? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, it's something like that. Yeah, it's like it's basically the same thing as that, if I recall correctly, because you can use it to make crystals in your kitchen. Yeah. And that's okay. basically what this is: is a crystallized version of that. And I have to admit. I tried it, and I don't care about the aluminum part, obviously, <laughs> but it really does a good job of just neutralizing the odors. Fantastic. I'm going to stick with, stick with my secret brand deodorant. Uh, secret is not a sponsor of Atheist Stock, but if you'd like to be, feel free. Contact us at radio at mnatheist.org. Um, I'll stick with my secret. Or if you're you're one of those crystal deodorant places, you can call us, too, because, I mean, I yeah. like I said... I, I find it a great way to just neutralize. I'm like, and then a little one lasts forever. And if you are an aluminum conspiracy person, we will also take your sponsorship dollars. (laughs) But we will not change our message. All right. So, well, because we are here to talk about some homeopathy, let's let's see what the dictionary says. So, homeopathy, a treatment of disease by minute doses of natural substances that in a healthy person would produce symptoms of disease. Yeah, I the homeopathy when you're asking what your favorite is, this one this one might be my favorite only because it's it's <laughs> It's so easily disprovable. Are we talking favorite and finger Fa- quotes? Favorite and favorite. Okay, we're going to the finger quotes yes, portion have, of this. Yes. These are these are going to be crazy pseudoscience and, and homeopathy stuff now that we've talked a little bit about. <laughs> yeah, I um, my, one of my favorite thing, you know, uh, stage things I saw was uh, James Randi. Um, he does, uh, I don't know if he still is actually performing anymore. He's, he's pretty old. He's like 90 four or something like that but there's a google video out there where he did a a google talk or a a talk somewhere and he's um he downs a whole bottle of homeopathic sleeping pills (laughs) at the beginning of the show as a way to say now it's it's helpful that i don't think he's a diabetic because there's a lot of sugar in that bottle um but there's actually nothing in that bottle that could hurt if anything it might keep him awake because the the, the, what the main ingredient in that was homeopath, homeopathic sleep. Well, the ingredient they're claiming that is doing the work at the dilution was caffeine. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, I mean, now granted, there's still no caffeine in that bottle because it's been diluted out. But, <laughs> like, because that's what homeopathy does. It's treating, it's taking the disease, giving you the, the poison, but saying that if you dilute that poison out far enough, then the poison actually becomes the cure. So... I, I'm actually looking at a skepticalscience.com website. Here, let me send it to you too, real quick. Um, where they're talking about the different categories that this person has found um, for homeopathy. Now, again, I can't guarantee anything on this show today. We're just having fun. <laughs> but I love how the animals include uh, dragonflies. Mm. A wild boar, <laughs> an albatross. I'm like looking, going, what? The is albatross that? is for pilots. <laughs> yes, it'll help them land better. <laughs> There's a dormouse and a hedgehog. I don't understand this at all. There was, um, 
at one point there was a homeopathy remedy for influenza that, that I remember Skeptics Get of the Universe covered. And the amount of, they were using, I think, duck liver in this, in this influenza remedy. And when you do the calculations for the amount of water molecules to the amount of duck liver molecules that, that are in um, the dilution, you were to the point where you would have one duck liver molecule in a bubble of water the size of the solar system. Which essentially means in each pill there is no duck liver. You might as well just go get some <laughs> pate. I mean... <laughs> no, because the dilution is what makes the strength. The more it's diluted, the stronger the medicine is. My brain hurts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. We have a message from Sam here. It's aluminum chloride, aluminum chlorate, and aluminum zirconium, according to scientificamerica.com. I'm guessing that was about the uh, deodorant. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sam, because as we were trying to remember that, we were perspiring. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying not to sweat the small stuff. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope I don't sweat too much because today I forgot my deodorant. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not going to tell you if I did. It's a secret. Oh, my. <laughs> Well, you're going to have to see us after the break about our s- <laughs> dovetailing into that break. <laughs> Thank you so much, and we'll be for listening to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Welcome back to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. You are tuned in to Atheist Talk, and I'm your host, Hertz T. Hertz. I'm here with today's guests, Julie and Maddie. Before we get back, however, I want to remind everyone listening live that immediately following the program, you can listen to Atheist American Atheist Viewpoint, an official production of American Atheist. Please note, you can always catch American Atheist Viewpoint by subscribing to the podcast version in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or the podcast player of your choice. As for the here and now, if you'd like to get involved in the conversation with Maddie, Julie, and I, this morning you can call us at 952-946-6205, email us at radio at mnatheist.org, or tweet us at, at Atheist Talk. Uh, and now we're going to talk about more natural stuff because I found another site. Big oh. surprise. Uh, did you say another site or a nutter site? Because I don't like, I'm not comfortable with the ableistic language. Another, another. <laughs> Anyways, but this is one that has 15 remedies. Like, this is more of the, the I think you called it natu- naturopathic? Yeah, naturopathy. Yeah, naturopathy. Um, you know, and I mean, it's kind of funny because some of these are things that actually I think I've done. Right. <laughs> you know, like, um, and it, it's not, I don't know how naturopathy this is because one of them is putting hydrogen peroxide in your ear. And I'm like, would a naturopathy go for that kind of chemical language? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, there might be some gray area of what, what actually falls under naturopathy. I, I, I'm not going to be claim to be a naturopathic a- expert there. Oh, yeah, no. Another another one actually uses super glue for, like, right. a paper cut. And I'm like, again, I'm kind of like, I don't know. Well, and that's quite where I get frustrated <laughs> is sometimes it gets hard because there's, like, half-truths in some of these things. Like, you, you go to the doctor, you get liquid. You, you would mention this during the break. You get a liquid bandage. That's It's not exactly super glue. But it's essentially like performing the same function. Yeah. And so it's like, well, yeah, sure, that works. Oh, and this one actually, I seriously remember, and actually, when I was at Camp Quest, this was one of the ones I was like, oh, why don't we do this? Is baking soda. Baking soda, and I would put baking soda and water on bee stings. Hmm. And it's supposed to help neutralize the sting. And honestly, I really honestly don't know because I'm betting you're going to start feeling better in about 30 minutes <laughs> anyway. Well, and like for me, if I get a bee sting, I'm going to swell up no matter what kind of, you know, salve you put on it. So. I learned how to, I learned how to um, apply an EpiPen though. That was kind of cool. <laughs> yes. Yes. EpiPens. <laughs> Real medicine. <laughs> yes. That works. Yes. I think one of my favorite quotes on all of this was from Tim Minchin, and it's he's got a fantastic uh, t- 10-minute beat poem that I encourage everybody to go listen to. It's called Storm, and part of it he goes off on, you know, alternative medicine by the definition is not medicine. Like, it's – because if it worked, it would just be called medicine. Like, 
<laughs> it's a great poem. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's here's some uh, things you should have in your emergency kit. And this is the emergency non non science based medicine kit. Yeah, well, I, that's my guess because it's. But yeah, it's like this is more of some of those naturopathy too. So this is like you know you should have like not a bug out kit, but like you know something you know the house went on fire or the tornado hit or something kind of kit, which I totally have oh yeah totally we are julie and i are very well prepared yeah and it's it's on the list of things to do because i need one for the car too um but yeah that's like the most useful remedy in your kit will probably be uh arnica montana made from a daisy found in the mountain regions of europe and the u.s um Uh And apparently, it heals wounds and injuries. It's interesting that hmm. sometimes, like the most, ex- the more exotic something is, uh, the more that it's supposed to be helpful. But it's a daisy, right? But it's found in the alpine regions, so therefore, it's hard to access, and so it must be even more potent. And I bet you, I bet you, people in prehistoric times used it, and we just haven't caught up to their to their level of technology. Yet. That is true. That is true. Well, it looks like we. Might have a caller. <gasps> we have a homeopathic caller. We have Lynette from Chaska. Hello, Lynette, and welcome to Atheist Talk. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm listening to you guys say laughing. Um, I um, I have have worked at a nutrition store, and we had all those things that you're talking about. And to be fair, I have to say that. They have worked for me very well. So, you know, I think it's kind of an individual thing. Like, it might sound funny when you read these things, and I understand. I've, I've, you know, I'm in my 50s. I've been to doctors throughout my life, and many times I have taken a prescription, and I'm talking mostly about depression now, um, and they will say there is no side effects with this. They will tell me that. And then I will get home, and I will take it, and then I'll have, like, a horrible headache or something, and then they will say, but there are no side effects, and you are the first person that we have heard that has had that. And then I will look it up online, and I will see that, oh, no, there are side effects with this. So, I mean, and the thing with homeopathy, too, is that it's pretty cheap. I mean, it's not like somebody's, like, taking you for a ride with this stuff. I mean, it might be, like, five bucks a bottle, and it won't do anything. It, all, the worst it'll do is nothing. Mm-hmm. And But I have to say that I've had a lot of success with it, so it really depends on your system because I've had no success with prescription drugs and maybe scientifically it should work and that's what they tell me but for me personally I've had much better luck with the so-called alternative medicine I, I, so I, I there's do, that I guess I do have to say I'm surprised that your doctors would state that they don't have that the medicines they give you don't have side effects those are bad doctors yeah because I don't think I've ever had a doctor. I mean, usually they'll say, you know, look at the prescription for the side effects. You know, the the pharmacist will know more about it because I think that's what the pharmacist is supposed to do. They're supposed to know all of those. And, you know, do you you have questions for the pharmacist? You can always ask your pharmacist. And if your pharmacist says there's no side effects, you should look at getting a different pharmacist. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know of any medication that doesn't have any side effects. I don't know of any medication that is going to actually do something pharmacologically in your body that has, you know, zero side effects. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lynette. Um, you know, Lynette makes a, Lynette brings up an, an interesting point in that she says, you know, they, they have worked for her in the past. And I completely believe her that when she said, I don't think she's making that up. I don't think she's lying. At the same time, it doesn't mean that what she's saying is accurately reflecting reality. You know, it's well, and it it does depend on what she's taking because things like the willow bark and things like that. Okay, that has the salicylic, the salicylic acid, acid yeah. in it, which is aspirin. So maybe there is something in there that that might work, but not in the way that they're trying to portray it as working. Yeah, it's also the thing of with with those natural like those herb pills and such. I always get nervous because there's been some studies done and they don't necessarily have what they say in it, and they're not. It's not like it's not like the pharmaceutical companies where they have to say exactly what is in it and exactly what it will do and any side effects. Because I'm sure there's some of those natural remedies that 
do have side effects. Yeah, the, the supplement industry and the organic, uh, I'm not sorry, the supplement and the homeopathic industry is completely unregulated. The only thing power the FDA has is they can pull it if it has demonstrated harm, but it first has to demonstrate harm. Whereas something from the first pharmaceutical industry has to demonstrate eff- efficacy and safety. All right. Well, we will be back in just a moment with Maddie and Julie right after the break. Please stay with us. I'm Hertzy Hertz, and you're listening to Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF. I'm your host, Hertzie Hertz, and we're classifying what I would... We're having what I would classify. This is what happens when I'm gone for a week. <laughs> I was compl- I had like no internet or anything. And it's like, wait, what am I doing again? But we are having a fascinating conversation with Julie and Maddie. Before we continue with this conversation, which will be our f- almost final segment with Maddie and Julie, there's a bit of housekeeping I need to attend to. Atheist Talk is produced with the funding for Minnesota Atheists, Cucumbers Re- and Cucumbers Restaurant in Edina. Please consider visiting our sponsors. And if you do, let them know that you appreciate their support of Atheist Talk. If you'd like to advertise on this program and help keep us on the air, please contact us at radio at mnatheist.org. I'd also like to note our group of dedicated volunteers and the generous do- donations of you, our listeners. You'll help keep Atheist Talk on the air and in podcast form. I also want to note our donors of the week, which is all of you, because I don't have a specific donor of the week, which makes me a little sad. But if you're able to help with a donation and let me say, call out a name, please consider doing show so at our Radio Fund page or at our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Atheist Talk. Minnesota Atheists is a 501c3 tax-deductible organization, and we couldn't do this show without you. Music for Minnesota Atheists is by composer and my member Brent Michael Davis and is used with permission. Please note, all the opinions are the guests and hosts only and do not necessarily reflect those of Minnesota Atheists as an organization. As always, please check out the Minnesota Atheists website for podcasts of previous programs. You can browse articles, book reviews, peruse the calendar of upcoming events. You can also sign up for Atheist Weekly email, which... W- yeah, which will tell you links and give you links to upcoming events. I'm laughing, Julie. I can see you. <laughs> Um, we have a ton of activities going around the Twin Cities and the outlying suburbs. Like, I think next week, I think we're doing the uh, Cucumbers Brunch again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think uh, of course, I have to work. Oh, well, I guess I'll just have to go then. All right. And if you enjoyed the show and all the Minnesota Atheists has to offer, please consider becoming a member of Minnesota Atheists while you're on the website. It has some great perks. Checks out the hows and whys on the website. With all that useful information out of the way, let's get back to our conversation with Maddie and Julie. So we were talking about some of the some of the you know stuff in there, like you know the FDA coming in and stuff like that. Um, and I was on the site uh, grow the grow network dot com, and it has that's the one with the twelve homeopathic remedies that should be in every survival kit. And this one, uh, you know, it's like I do not know much about <laughs> herbs or anything like that. I, a lot of what I know comes from like Harry Potter <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> some other fantasy books that well and the interesting part is a lot of those fantasy books will actually kind of do a little research on it and kind of figure out what the herb is used for or if it's bad or good so you kind of have an idea um and this one talks about if your children come down with a high fever or a headache or a sore throat which apparently will worsen after 3 p.m i was gonna say i don't have kids so i'm gonna look at you too is, is that like a thing mm. I, I think kids tend to symptom more towards night when they're tired or maybe they're crabby because they haven't had their nap because they yeah. don't feel good Exactly. Or maybe the adults are just more crabby because it's like I've been dealing with this now for 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. And I think that when, when they're tired, their, their defenses go down a little bit so they can yeah. finally start saying they don't feel good because they always want to be doing something. Um, but if they have this headache, fever, sore throat, you should give them belladonna, which I was like, the last time I checked, belladonna was a poison. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a recent, the FDA recently had to pull a bunch of teething uh, uh, remedies for teething off the shelf because the amount of belladonna in these teething remedies was reaching the level of, of, of harm. Because normally with homeopathy, 
you don't actually have any of the ingredient that is listed because it's diluted out. Um, but these ones, unfortunately, unfortunately did, which is really, really, and it gets a little in the blurred lines of, you know, sometimes something will say it's homeopathic, which means it should have little to no of the ingredient in, but it's not actually homeopathic. But there's no regulation saying they can't call themselves homeopathic, which is frustrating. Because, like, if I want to buy aspirin, we were talking about salicylic acid, I know exactly how much aspirin is in that tablet to know how much I can take, how much I should take. Like, I know that 500 milligrams has worked for me in the past. I know that if I take 2,000 milligrams, I could have some problems with platelets and, you know, my blood clotting <laughs> and, you know, other nasty side effects. I don't know that if I'm giving my baby a belladonna teething. Uh, I, and I don't remember, was it gel or or what? I'm assuming gel because that's what you, we usually... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm trying to picture a belladonna frozen teething. <laughs> <laughs> and does belladonna even taste good? You know, I've never tried belladonna as evidenced by the fact that I'm sitting here and able to talk. <laughs> I'm sure they put good tasting stuff in it so yeah. your kid will want it. Yeah, they probably yeah. put sugar in it. I mean, at that point, I think you're safer giving your kid whiskey on their gums than belladonna. And I don't advocate putting putting whiskey on your kid's gums either. Yeah, but it works. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> it makes your it makes the parents feel better. <laughs> Wait, is that the whiskey on the kids' gums or the whiskey on my gums? Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> Um, but you said there was another one where where it was pulled off the shelves by yeah. the FDA. Zycam. Zycam is still you know sold on the shelf, but for a while there was uh, Zycam is a they use zinc and it's it's not a homeopathic remedy. It's a naturopathic remedy. I think they build themselves as a homeopathic remedy, even though there's an active ingredient in it. But they had these swabs for your cold, and you'd swab the inside of your nose, and it was supposed to you know lessen the symptoms of your cold or help you get over it faster. Unfortunately, the level of zinc in these nasal swabs was high enough that it was actually causing toxicity and causing people to lose their sense of smell, sometimes permanently, sometimes for long-term, temp- like temporary, but like months. And, and for our listeners, you know, please remember that also means that your sense of taste would be greatly diminished. Yeah. And you would not be able to smell you know, fresh-baked cookies. Or, or the natural gas leaking from your stove. <laughs> Okay, fine. We can go for the practical matters here. I was just thinking cookies. I have an electric stove, so I don't have to worry about that. I just, it's one of those, it's, that's what frustrates me is that, you know, these, these, these industries aren't regulated. You don't know if it has the thing in it. You can't prove the efficacy of the thing in it. It's just, it's so frustrating to me that they're allowed to, that they're allowed to, and the idea that people will say, well, I want to take this and because of big pharma. Most of these supplement companies are owned by the same companies that own, quote, big pharma. And the supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Like, they're, <laughs> even if they weren't owned by big pharma, they'd still be big supplement. Like, whatever you know, nefarious things you'd have for a company and a corporation like Big Pharma, you'd have for <laughs> for Big Supplement, too. Accountants are everywhere. Yes. <laughs> Says the accountant. <laughs> well, and I think it's important to note that if you take supplements and you believe in supplements or whatever, you know, while I disagree with people, like, on that, like, on that issue, it's not like people are stupid. It's not like I'm not, I definitely don't want to come off that way because, you know, it's, I, I have blind spots to my skepticism as well. So I, I hate and anecdotal evidence is powerful. Personal testimony is powerful. The fact that it, that it felt like it worked for you because of confirmation bias, that's powerful. The fear that sometimes we have of doctors lying to us, like that the doctors apparently lied to that caller. I mean, that's an in, incompetent doctor and that drives people into supplemental medicine and alternative medicine is some of the incompetence in the impersonal and personalness of, of, of modern medicine. And Julie, you had you had one. Well, I was just reading about our um, favorite topic in the vaccination. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, uh, make me grit my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> you know where 
homeopaths, and I find this um, on Wikipedia, it's very interesting, some homeopaths, and it says in parentheses, particularly those are non-physicians. That's a whole nother show, I'm sure. Physicians that are homeopaths. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Advise their parents against immunization, but they suggest to replace this with their homeopathic, they call them nosodes, created from biological materials such as pus, disease tissue, bacilli from sputum, or in the cases of bowel nosodes, feces. Ew. But <laughs> then again, vaccines are made from, like, some of these same things. So the... This is where it gets gray for me because you're there again, like with the willow bark and and that you're creating something that might actually work to an extent. Like, well, small the first vac the first treatments for smallpox was to take you know pus and you know re inoculate mm-hmm. somebody by by scraping their skin. And wasn't that um, they use like cowpox or mm-hmm. something too? So it was like it was similar enough that you might get like. A small reaction, but you wouldn't like get the full smallpox. Right. right. Well, it was a different disease, but the yeah. disease, the proteins on the cowpox, were similar. The antigens are similar enough that if your body can make the vi- the antibodies to the cowpox, your body will be able to have antibodies against the smallpox. Yeah, and I know with with vaccines, what they typically do, and Maddie, you can correct me if I'm wrong because you probably know more about this than I do. That it, you know, it's like the genetic stuff you're getting is so small and it's so and it's either like broken down so it's like you just get the part that your white blood cells need but at the same time i mean there is such like fecal micro (laughs) transplant which if you've listened to the podcast citation needed they talked about in detail pioneered at the university of minnesota yes and what what did we have we also yeah there's also there was a doctor there this is i'm getting from mary roach's book gulp um and she talks about there was a, it's a research team at the University of Minnesota, and this is a decade ago. I don't know if it's still there. They were investigating the smells from farts and like ways to like remove the smell. They the, this guy apparently had this thing like he put foil around your like those that those mylar like marathon running type material, make pants out of that to capture the gas so they could analyze it. They had something like a a charcoal activated like seat cushion for your chair. So when you're in an office meeting and you, you could pass gas, he called it the toot trapper. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't trap the sound. Nope. <laughs> well, but, yeah, but that way it can be silent but not deadly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that... Yeah, fecal transplants, you know, they're, they are a thing. And one of the problems that we're having in the, in the healthcare community, and, I fe- and it's getting better, is that how to code for a fecal transplant. And for a long time, doctors were having to, like, qu- like eat the charge for some of the fecal transplant because the only thing they could charge for was, like, the colonoscopy aspect of it mm. because the, there was no, like, ICD-10 code. I, at the time, ICD-9, maybe ICD-10. That's getting deep into the weeds of medical stuff. But yeah, I was going to say, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Actually, time, there was no, that would be a CPT code. Sorry. At the time, there was no CPT code built. <laughs> so, Yeah. <laughs> We're in my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> the three of us could start a clinic. <laughs> you do the coding, you do the labs, and I'll do the books. And I'm going to get my my I will get my degree as a as a licensed naturopath. It's only like hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get your licensed naturopathic degree. And you can become accredited by whatever the National Naturopathic Association is that that accredits their own people. Like, hey, woo people believe accrediting other woo people. All woo. right. <laughs> yeah, the Ric Flair Association. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do believe we'll be back for a couple minutes when we um, after this break. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk, and we'd love for you to join us again next Sunday, which should be another exciting episode. Uh, do you know? Do you know what it's going to be, or is it going to be? We got to figure Curtsy, it out. I'm, I'm at work next Sunday. <sighs> we'll so it out. next Sunday, I will be stabbing people for money, and analyzing their blood, analyzing their sputum, and analyzing their fecal samples, which will hopefully be moist. <laughs> I can't honestly I can't do much with a dry turd. <laughs>
It's just I can't. <laughs> you could dilute it down and use it as a vaccine. Oh my gosh, you know what? I'm going to market that to our ERs. Did you come in for diarrhea? Here, buy this. Well, I am proud to be on the air with Minnesota Atheists, and I hope you've enjoyed the show, because I know I have. Um, but this show does just depend on the generous support of our members, our sponsors, and our donors. Please consider supporting the show through the donation link at minnesotaatheists.org or through our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash American or not American Atheist, Atheist Talk. <laughs> This has been AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota, and I have a whole nother minute and a yes. half. <laughs> yeah, because we have American Atheist Viewpoint rolling up. But, exactly. You know, we're still, we're still, uh, we're recording for American Atheist Viewpoint right now while they are sorting out things that August talked about. Um, Absolutely. A few episodes ago. Um, so, yeah, but thankfully we have August, board member for American Atheists and board member for Minnesota Atheists, and he will be delivering his presentation for us um, excellent yeah do you have a teaser um i i started to listen to it because i you know i post for the podcast mm -hmm. and i was just to be honest i don't remember <laughs> well i mean you do do a lot of editing stuff so i can understand where you, you you're kind of doing more of the technical aspect of it yeah i'm listening for like sound quality buzz yeah listening for, well because i know that i know that with the youtube channel that Oftentimes I'm like, oh, shoot, is there buzzing? Can you hear the air conditioner? <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, the podcast show will be up on the radio page as soon as we're able. And that will be on our Libsyn, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher. If you can't find this show on your podcast catcher, email the show so I can fix it. Yes, please do. Thank you so much. And here's American Atheist Viewpoint. Hello. Welcome to the American Atheist Viewpoint for July 22nd, 2018. My name is August Berkshire, and I'm on the National Board of Directors of American Atheists, as well as being their Minnesota State Director. For a long time, scientists and economists have wondered if there was a link between how secular a country is and how prosperous it is. The two did seem to go hand in hand, with poorer countries tending to be more religious and richer countries tending to be more secular. But which came first, the prosperity or the secularity, and was there a causal relationship between the two? On July 18th of this week, the journal Science Advances published an article online entitled Religious Change Preceded Economic Change in the 20th Century. It was authored by Damien J. Ruck, R. Alexander Bentley, and Daniel J. Lawson. Ruck and Lawson are from the University of Bristol. Bentley is from the University of Tennessee. The authors looked at the history of many countries during the 20th century for which they were able to obtain data. They looked at religiosity. They looked at tolerance for individual rights. And they looked at economic conditions. Religiosity was determined by responses to the following questions. How important in your life is religion? How important is God in your life? Are you a religious person? How often do you attend religious services? How much confidence do you have in the church? And is religious faith an important quality to instill in a child? Tolerance for individual rights was measured by looking at people's attitudes towards homosexuality, divorce, suicide, and abortion. Prosperity was determined by GDP, gross domestic product, per capita. The article reached the following conclusions. Quote, In this study, we have shown that across a diversity of countries around the world, changes in secularization predicted changes in GDP worldwide during the 20th century. More broadly, this implies that changes in the everyday importance of religious practices preceded changes in economic development in the 20th century. While this does not yet isolate one path of causality, it determines that economic growth is not what caused secularization in the past. Our observation that secularization preceded economic change 
further rules out a bicausal relationship between income and religion, as well as the theory that socioeconomic advances cause religious practices to be phased out. Our multi-level, time-lagged regressions also indicate that tolerance for individual rights predicted 20th century economic growth even better than secularization. Our findings do not mean, however, that secularization was the ultimate cause of economic development. Tolerance of individual rights appears to be closer to an ultimate driver, in that more people are included in economic activity, especially women. The tolerance factor, which is most highly loaded on individual rights for divorce and abortion, is therefore likely to correlate with women's rights generally, was a better temporal predictor of GDP capital than the secularization factor. Although temporal changes in tolerance and in secularization were synchronous, secularization did not predict increased GDP in the absence of accompanying increases in tolerance. Besides tolerance, education is a possible driver of both economic development and secularization. End quotes. So there you have it. We have often th thought that as a country becomes more prosperous, it becomes more secular. But this study indicates that the opposite is true. As religion, and especially the intolerance it often spawns, declines, a country becomes more prosperous. And this makes sense if we think about it. Religion often teaches people to accept suffering because it's God's will or part, part of God's plan and that things will be better in an afterlife. They sometimes encourage people to pray rather than to try to improve their lot in life because they need people to be needy and subservient. Religions are often anti-woman, anti-gay, and anti-anyone who doesn't agree with them. As you remove the religious intolerance towards people and grant them more rights, they have a better chance to enter the workforce and increase prosperity. Religion can also be time-consuming. If time spent on religion, religion is instead spent productively, a country is more likely to prosper. It seems that atheism is the real prosperity gospel. Thank you for tuning in to the American Atheist Viewpoint. If you would like more information about American Atheists, including how to become a member or magazine subscriber, or our local affiliates, or the National Convention, or the books and products we have for sale, please go to atheists.org. Thank you.